right guys, I want to do a little video on how to do radio calls in and out of the atmospheric control zone. So we've got a couple different routes today. We're going to be using the Northwest helicopter route. Um, we've got the ground frequency dialed up, 118 de or 121 decimal 8. And uh, so we're going to call ground first. We're on the ground right here at BC Helicopters. We've listened to ATIS. Uh, ATIS is 119 or decimal 8. And uh, we listened to ATIS. We have information Delta today. So we're going to call up ground. We're going to say atmosphere ground. This is helicopter Cabri G2, so tell them the type of helicopter they were flying. Um, Golf Uniform Tango Echo, that's the call sign that we're using. And then uh, with Delta, so the information that we've listened to. Then when they're gonna get back to us, our second call is we're gonna say, Uniform Tango Echo is on the ground at BC Helicopters, requesting a Northwest departure. Okay, go ahead with your first call. Okay, so I'm gonna say, Abbots for ground, Cabri G2, unif uh, Golf Uniform Tango Echo. With Delta. With Delta, yeah, you bet, go for it. Habits for ground, Cabri G2, Golf Uniform Tango Echo, with Delta. Cabri G2, Golf Uniform Tango Echo, Habits for ground. On the ground at BC Helicopters, requesting a Northwest departure. On the ground at North at BC Hel Helicopters, requesting a Northwest departure. Got it. Uniform Tango Echo, Roger, contact Tower 119, decimal 4 in, when ready for departure, squad 5560. 5560, Uniform Tango Echo. Uniform Tango Echo. Perfect. He told us to switch over to the tower frequency 119 or decimal 4 when we're ready. We are ready. So we just switched over and 5560 is our transponder code. So that's really good. Really important. Anytime you guys make a radio call, you listen for a second, maybe two seconds. Make sure that there's no conversation going on. Nobody's talking on the radio. When it's quiet, then you can click on the mic and start talking. Awesome. Let's get going. Alright. Okay, so we're all ready to go. Why don't you call Tower now and just say, Tower, it's Golf Uniform Tango Echo, ready for departure. Tower, Golf Uniform Tango Echo, ready for departure. Awesome, we're Uniform Tango okay. Echo, take off from BC Helicopters at your discretion. Cut across runway 19 and out by the Northwest Helicopter. Uniform Tango Echo. Uniform Tango Echo. Okay, so we're going to have a pedal turn here. He gave us the clearance across runway 19. Now, we can either repeat that back to him, it's not a bad idea to repeat that back, or we can just acknowledge, if it's a hold short, we have to repeat back the hold short. So if he says hold short runway 19, then we have to say hold short, short runway 19. Okay, you have control? Okay, I have control. And let's go ahead and fly away here. Okay, we can start a right turn here. Alright, so this is the infield here. Um, obviously this uh, grass area is the infield, this is taxiway delta here. That runway there is uh, runway 0119, so if you're landing this way, it's 19. We're gonna go a bit more to the right here. There's a helicopter there. We wanna make sure we never fly over another helicopter, though that's looking good. And then uh, the threshold of a runway, he didn't give us any specific clearance over the runway, but the threshold is right at the beginning of the runway, right where those white lines are there. Right. Um, so if he said cleared over the threshold of runway 19, we'd have to go here, or if he said through the approach, we'd have to go through that part there, which is the approach, so. That's good. So when we're going out the northwest route, we want to be climbing up to 800 feet initially. So we'll keep the climb going here to 800. And then once we get to the freeway up ahead of us here, then we're going to go to 1,000 feet. The reason we have those altitude restrictions, uh, if we look at the CFS, the book that you're going to learn about tomorrow, um, it tells us specific altitudes for the routes and different parts of them. So we're going to keep that climb going all the way to 800 for now. All right. All right. So now we're going to go over to the practice area frequency. Exactly. So when you get to the edge of the control zone, uh, you want to call clear of the control zone. So you would just say, um, Uniform Tango Echo, clear to the northwest. But because he already called us, uh, we just missed getting that on the camera. Um, he just said, he called us and said, Uniform Tango Echo, you're clear to the northwest. Uh, switch on route frequency. So Should I be climbing above these clouds? Yeah, so we just got a couple little skiffs here. We can start a bit of a climb to get above them. That's going to be fun. Perfect. Then we want to switch over to the practice area frequency, and because we are to the west of the mission bridge, we're going to go over to 122.72. Alright, we can dial that guy up, 22.72. And there we are there. Now we want to do our first radio call to the practice area. So, uh, identifying where we are, there's mission, this is Matsqui Island. So you can call Matsqui Island traffic. And this is the western tip of Matsqui Island right now. So you can just say, Matsqui Island traffic, helicopter, Cavalry G2, Gulf Uniform Tango Echo, at the western tip of Matsqui Island, uh, 1,200 feet northbound. Matsqui Island traffic, Cavalry G2, Uniform Tango Echo, at the western tip of Matsqui Island, heading northbound, at 1,000. 
300 feet. Fantastic. All right, good. So now we've notified everybody in this area what we're doing and where we're going. It's a bit of a rainy day out there, and uh, so I figured I'd like to go back up to Stave Strip today and practice some more of those circuits and really get nailed on those takeoffs and landings and do some bunny hops. Uh, so we're going to do that, but on the way up there, it'd be a fantastic thing to do to do some instruments. So what I've done um, is him and I have gone on to four flight here, and we have set up a track. So you guys can kind of see this here. I'll zoom that in a little bit. And so you can see there's a track set up on his four flight, and that's what I want him to fly. So I'm actually not giving him any heading right now. I have told him that I'd like to maintain 80 knots and 1,500 feet. So you can see he's not bad. He's got about four knots to slow down, about 20 feet or so to descend. So it's not bad overall. Um, and then we've got two things set up here on the left. We've got a synthetic vision, and that tells him any terrain that he's gonna hit. So anything that's red here, you can see that that would be something that he would hit. So this kind of gives him an extra little thing to look for. And then on the right, that's his actual track. So you can see the aircraft down here. And then we've got a line set up for him um, to be flying on. So that's what he's working on right now. Uh, he's holding 1,500 feet. Now the track that we've set up is mostly over the water. So the idea is I've set it up um, to kind of take us up the, the Stave waterway. Here's Stave Falls right now. I'm going to do a quick radio call. Uh, Stave Falls traffic, helicopter cabbage, G2, Golf Uniform Tango Echo. It's just coming over top of Stave Falls at 1,500 feet, and we're headed to the north. All right, so you can see he's got a point on there right now that starts turning him to the left, and so that's why he's got a bank on. Now, we've talked about when you're in turns, you don't want to be banking any more than about 10 degrees. So right now, the first white line there is showing about a 10-degree bank. He's leveled that back out, and if I look at his track, it shows that he's pretty much right back on track again. So that's looking good. So it's kind of cool for me as an instructor, I can set this up ahead of time with him and then he can fly it. And then I'm just monitoring. I'm kind of his safety pilot to make sure that we're not going to uh, actually fly into any terrain or anything. But without me saying anything, I can actually just monitor him flying up an actual predetermined route. And in this case, it's through the mountains. Now, you would never do this on instruments. If you had to fly instruments, you'd fly much higher and get above the terrain. Um, but if you were in a really dire situation um, and you got stuck somewhere in cloud accidentally, you could theoretically use this stuff. It's not certified, it's not, it's not safe to do it, so please don't do it. Uh, but it just kind of gives you an idea of what technology is capable of. So you can kind of see there's the terrain there. Um, you can see that there's a little bit of a mountain in front of him, but he's above it right now. Now if you guys have a look out the window, there's that mountain right there, and he's above that one right now, and you can see we are over water, and it is showing that we're over water there. So it's extremely accurate, um, but it has a little bit of a lag, a little bit of a delay. You'd never want to trust it in real life unless it was in a dire emergency situation. But he's doing really good. He's keeping right on his track right now. And um, speed-wise, not bad. We got um, 76, so we got a couple knots of speed up there, about four knots of speed up. And uh, Cyclic is always controlling the airspeed. Collective is controlling your altitude, so you're about 50 feet high right now. You can work that down slowly, and it's looking good. So uh, basically, we've got him working all the way up Stave Lake, and there's some terrain in front of us, so his line has actually got him going to the right of that terrain, and then back out over the middle of the Stave Lake area there. So pretty neat. I've talked about this in other videos now, but uh, it's interesting. We've got ourselves out over the middle of Stave Lake. You guys can see, you can see it on the iPad there. And as soon as we lose any land reference, so with his hood on that, uh, that he's got, there's always a little bit of visibility that you can see kind of on the bottom, kind of by your feet there. And um, it doesn't take much reference, and I learned this on the world trip with uh, flying over the desert and near brownout conditions and stuff like that. All it takes is a little tiny bit of reference on the ground, and, and right away you have full spatial awareness. So um, what I try and do a lot of the time on my uh, students' in instrument flying is to get them out over uh, something that's uniform. So in the winter time, we can get over a nice uh, layer of snow, that really helps. Or if we can get out over a big lake like this, or a river, um, or if there's a low patch of fog and we can see lots of terrain around and stuff, we'll get them over the low patch of fog. And um, something that just kind of blanks out all their reference. And so now they do have to fully, 100% re rely on those instruments. That's kind of what we're doing right now. And uh, he's doing a really fantastic job keeping it nice and steady, nice and safe. Uh, you can see we're just a tiny bit high on the altitude there. Um, we'll start working that down as well as our speed needs to come up just a little bit. 
always trying to be just a hundred percent accurate on those numbers um, if you're not quite a hundred percent keep working on it because when you are in clouds you know everything matters every 20 feet matters and every five knots matters and stuff like that so you're doing a really really good job here okay so we're going to be talking about a little bit about weather here today and um, so we want to talk about getting into a, a valley like this. This one we know sort of has a dead end, so we're not trying to get through. But let's say we're trying to get up here for a certain purpose. Um, you want to kind of stick over to one side of the valley, give yourself lots of room to be turning around. Let's uh, start slowing down a little bit here now. We can climb up just a touch as well. And um, we want to have a bit of height off the ground. We want to be pre-thinking as well. How much power am I going to be using if I were to try and hover here? So would I actually be able to hover? You can look at your altimeter, you can say, okay, I'm 50 Feet. Where am I going with now? a little bit of uh, just over to the edge here with a little bit of basic math we can start slowing down a little bit uh, once you know the performance of the aircraft you can start saying okay yeah I have enough power to, to hover here and then like I say that the altitude that we have right now is good let's fly together oh. yep the altitude that we have is great so we can say okay well, let's say I need to get in over here and I need to figure out if I can uh, if I can get in close to these clouds or not so I'm gonna want to slow the aircraft down and you never ever want to push any limits so you say okay there's the edge of the cloud now another thing that we have to consider is temperature right if we're anywhere near freezing like within two or three degrees of zero we have to just say okay we're going to get out of here um, so this is fine right now we've got uh, like 15 degrees celsius outside um, so we have no issues with with icing and let's say we needed to get onto a helipad right here or something this would be about the worst weather we'd want to get into. So you can see we're right at the base of the clouds right now. Right. And I'm looking at my power setting and saying okay, I have a 90%, so I have no problem. If I was running out of power, like 100%, I'd just dive off to the left and fly away. But I have lots of height off the ground. That's really, really critical right now. Now, a major danger thing. Right now, landing here, there's no danger, okay? So the winds are light. I have enough visibility. I know I'm not going to hit anything, right? So if there was a helipad perch right here, I have to get a customer here or something. No problem. I can just get him in here and, and we can land. What's the danger you think of doing this, though? Um, I'm not sure. Okay, so if you're just going to drop him off and fly away, there's no danger for you. You just hop in here, he gets out, and you fly away. But what about getting him again? Uh, <laughs> We're right it. on the base of the cloud here. The clouds shift all the time. They're constantly moving. Right now, I bet you they've already moved. I'm, I'm constantly looking out the left window just to see if we have enough room to get out. If I see these clouds coming down, immediately we have to get away again, right? Right. And so, if I'm just gonna drop and go, well, that's great, but he better be prepared to spend the night, because he might have to, right? right? Or if I have to shut down here, uh, let's say it's a photo flight or whatever it happens to be, you know, you're gonna have to be here half an hour, an hour, is the weather conditions gonna shift on you, right? And so if you're thinking that through ahead of time, you go, okay, no, this isn't worth it. If it was you know, further away, then you have time to watch those clouds come down and get closer to you and stuff. And then right. you can tell your customer, okay, guys, we gotta get going, right? right. Um, so this scenario right here is a no-go. I wouldn't, I wouldn't land for the sake of shutting down because it's just a little bit too uh, worrisome that we're gonna actually get clouded in, right? Right. Okay, now we're gonna fly away, make sure you got the good reference again. And then off we go, we fucked up a little bit here, but start blowing that away. Okay, you can take control there. Okay, uh, control. Awesome. So we are just talking about in reduced visibility. We have visibility on the left here. Not so much on the right over towards the lake. So if we needed to turn around, we wouldn't want to turn out towards where we have no reference. So we're going to do what's called a rapid decel 1A turn. Okay? okay? Let's do one together. I want you to fly. We're going to do it together here. Alright. So we're going to go collective down, left pedal, nose up, get into a nice bank turn, about a 30 degree bank, and then just get that turn to happen. We don't want to descend or climb. We also don't want to slow down below 40 knots. Okay. And as we come through that turn, we're trying to accelerate and fly away. Now, normally I don't tell you to turn towards a mountain. Right. But in this instance, it's actually much safer to turn towards a mountain than it is out over a, a abyss of nothingness that you can't really see. Okay. Right. Okay, so we're going to do another one. You're going to do this one. I'm just going to ride along for safety. So we got enough room to the mountain because we're going to be slowing down. Okay. So we're going to do this in three, two, one. So collective down, left pedal, nose up. Nice, not too steep of a bank. Nose up a little bit. That's good. Otherwise, we descend. And then we don't slow down below 40, so we start accelerating. There we go. Power is coming back up. Cyclic's coming forward and flying away. Awesome. Go back to cruise power settings, about 80. So you have control. You would do that 
if um, you were in a situation where there's maybe some power lines in front of you and you immediately had to turn around, uh, more realistically, you would have time if you saw some clouds coming up and it's like, no, we're not going to make this, let's get a turn done. So you just kind of hit the brakes, get the nose up, get that turn nice and tight around. The reason for lowering the power is so that you don't have the big G load in, it allows you to do a much tighter turn. But it's very critical as you get into the turn and you kind of nice coordinated into the turn, power has to start coming back up cycling forward because you need to accelerate out of the turn. If you don't accelerate out of the turn, you'll start sinking and then you start losing altitude. And that's really dangerous if you're down at like 100 feet or 200 feet yeah. and that happens. Oh, you come out of that turn, you're sinking and bam, you're into the ground, right? Right. So very critical. So we're up at the end of Stave now. We're going to get set up for some of our circuits and buddy hopping here. So you're going to be talking to Stave Lake traffic. Yep. We're going to tell them that we are at 1,000 feet, just leaving Stave Strip at its southbound. Okay. Stave Lake traffic, WG2 Uniform Tango Echo. Just leaving Stave Strip at 1,000 feet, heading southbound. So Viz looks decent here. Um, if it starts to get worse, we're going to drop it down a little bit. Um, I think it might be worse on this side of the lake than that side of the lake, but we'll see. I think what we'll do is go from this point here, kind of cross the lake, go to the other side, and it looks like maybe a little bit of heavier rain up ahead. But again, hard to tell because there's a bit of low cloud kind of sitting in front of us. If we drop down one or 200 feet, we might actually be able to see a bit more Viz. So let's do that dive a little bit. We can keep our power set to cruise. We'll just nose dive a little bit. And you see when you do that, even though we've only lost 100 feet here, that's good. We can level out again. See how the viz increased? Yep. So now we can see all the way down the lake and that's way, way better. So now it doesn't really matter which side you choose, left or right. It's up to you uh, because both have good viz. So we can actually see the point way out there. I like that. This is good. This class is fantastic because you get to learn in all types of weather. <laughs> yeah, wow, what a mind uh, <laughs> under there. Yeah, and it's interesting, I was noticing just psychologically here, um, you were asking, well, what's going on here with your takeoffs and landings and stuff like that up at Stave Strip? Yeah. Because you felt like, I think what happened was, and this is just a, a guess, is the, first of all, I put you on quite a bit of work there, workload with the instruments. And then we dealt with a bit of uh, low cloud stuff up in the, the side of, um, Mount Robbie there. Yeah. And so your mind was kind of overwhelmed with all the new stuff coming at you. Yep. And then we did some uh, rapid D cell 180 turns. So your mind was churning over all that information going like, whoa, that's a lot to take in. And then I was like, okay, well, why don't we go do some takeoffs and landings? <laughs> and then uh, and then you're giving your heart, yourself a hard time for, I mean, you did good, uh, but not as good as what you wanted to do, right? Of course. So, but but I think the thing that I didn't realize was how much the ground was actually sloping. Yes, it was very sloping. I didn't realize that until you pointed it out. Yeah. I thought it was much flatter. It was doing all kinds of things. And the so... Main, the main slope was actually sloped to the right. Yeah. And, and that was actually helpful for us because in the cavalry, the right skid naturally hangs low. Yeah. So when there's two people in normal fuel, it actually sits a little bit like this, right skid low. And that's due to the translating tendency. So the tendency for the helicopter, because of the tail rotor, to want to drift to the left. And so there's a, a thrust couple created by the cyclic being pushed a little bit to the right to stop that drift. And so it actually rolls your helicopter a little bit to the right. right. And um, so naturally, when you're sitting there on, you know, just in a hover, it's actually good to land with a slight slope to the right because it actually feels like a level landing, interesting enough, right? Right. So that was fine, but then we were compounding it with, it was a slight slope uh, forward as well, just down the runway. And so we were landing just slightly on the heels there. Yeah, I think no. that was confusing me because yeah. uh, I wasn't aware of that slope, so that heel touch was freaking me out. Exactly, yeah. So, that's all good. Nice work. And the Viz is getting a little bit better here already. So if you feel that, we're down at 700 now. Uh, we can go ahead and climb it back up again. Always trying to find that nice balance between height. Why do we want height? Well, if the engine quits, you need time to think, right? So right. you look around and go, okay, well, I can make that beach. If you had an extra 500 feet, you might be able to make it to a slightly spot on the beach or something. Right. And uh, so time is good if you can have it. And then, not that we always do have that ability, but, um, and then obviously staying a good safe distance for the little So that's nice. And we can see here, we're pretty close to track, which is good. So we're doing well. Okay, so I also want to introduce the concept of a forced approach. So a forced approach is a surprise engine failure. Now, today's not going to be as big of a surprise, obviously, because we're talking about it. <laughs> but in the future, they will be surprises. And so 
Um, now, just something good for you to know as an instructor, I'm never going to roll the throttle off on you if I can't see a good safe landing spot, okay? I want to make sure that if the engine actually does quit on us accidentally, that we can actually land the helicopter safely, okay? Right. So I'm looking around, you don't know this, but I'm looking around and I see, okay, there's a nice beach there. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go engine failure and I'm going to roll the throttle off on you. It's up to you to lower the collective nice and coordinated, nice and quick, and get the helicopter going in a safe direction, okay? So engine failure, good, collective down all the way nice and quick. There you go, not too much nose up. There we go, that's level. Let's start turning this way. We can see that there's some landing spots over there. And as we do that, we're glancing at our rotor RPM, making sure that we're not overspeeding or underspeeding. Let's turn a little faster. We can see there's some good beaches, but we need to make sure we turn to get to them. We're watching our rotor RPM. That's good right there. Speed we want at what speed? 50 uh, knots? 50 knots. Yeah, so we're going a little fast. Slow down a little bit. RPM is quite nice. Got a good open spot. I'm going to go for this road here in front of us. Okay. This is great right now. And here comes a flare. Nice hard flare. Throttle is getting rolled back on. Now, forced approach will always be power recovery unless the engine's actually off. Right. And so we're just going to go into a nice hover. The reason for that, I'm going to give you control there. Okay, uh, control. And let's pedal turn. Yeah, tilt's going to the right. Pedal turn left because we just passed the stump here. The reason for that always being a power recovery is because I don't know what that landing surface is like, right? right. Unless, unless I chop the throttle on you in the infield, but I'm never going to do that. That wouldn't really make sense. Um, so I never want to land here unless I pre-check the landing spot. I know it's 100% flat, smooth, and not going to sink into it or anything like that because I don't want any chance of rolling over. So, right. so you can always have the insurance to know if I go engine failure and I roll the throttle off, bam, collective down, start looking for a spot, go for the safest spot you can, but it's always going to be firing your brain. Right. Unless if for some reason we notice when we're doing our rotor motor speed trim that uh, we don't have any um, engine RPM. Right. Then we're which in this scenario, with this road here, would have actually worked out really great. We would have ended up on a nice full-on auto, and we would have stayed right side up. Been good. So, uh, let's just get around this stump here, and then we can go for takeoff. I don't see any traffic. Fantastic. Where we go.
especially like a Bell 212 blade slab, that's like one of the really big ones. Um, yeah, you guys 